something turned into something else that turned into something else that turned into something else that turned into stars, that turned into planets, that turned into chemicals, turned into other chemicals, that turned into life, that turned into other forms of life, that turned into us. I mean, something turned into something else. Or something made those things. Something made stars. Something made time, space, and energy. Something made matter. It's really like, it's even simpler than that. If you can envision the entire universe as this box, I mean, it's kind of tough, but just stretch your imagination. Everything out there is represented by this box. And inside the box, you've got jewels. It's a jewelry box, okay? Necklaces and pennants and beautifully crafted silver jewelry. Those are like the animals here on Earth and the ecosystems and the whales and giraffes and, and you know, your, your dog. They're just very intricately made. Only two possibilities. Either the box made itself and everything inside the box made itself or something outside of the box made the box. Okay, that's it. There are no other possibilities. Now, what you've got to realize we're up against, our entire media and education system, millions of people and teachers, billions of dollars are poured into programming everybody around us with only one of those two possibilities that the box made itself. Everything inside the box made itself. Now, they'll throw lip service that, well, maybe God started it out, but that still means something turned into something that turned into something else that turned into everything else. So there is no evidence for God because the box made itself. That's what they're teaching. It's still a subset of that first possibility. Now, imagine, just imagine what our culture would be like if Christians just started treating God's word as if it meant what it said in a real clear, straightforward way. I don't even use the word literal, just a straightforward understanding. Treated it like you would treat any other book you read, which means if it says something, well, it kind of means what it says. You see, the Bible basically gives us a model for all of reality. Ten times in the very first chapter, it says creatures reproduce after their own kind. Trees reproduce after their own kind. In modern language, trees only make trees. Fish only make fish. Birds only make birds. Cattle only make cattle. It, it says ten different times in different ways the same thing. Because it's true. That is biology. See, this is a biology book. It's the foundation for then going and understanding the biological world. And then the biggest hang-up people have with Christianity, you ask anybody who's not a Christian, why don't you want to believe in God? Why don't you, why don't you want to believe in the Bible? It, in one way or another, we often come down to, well, look at the world. It's full of death. It's full of disease. It's full of evil. Where is this God you're talking about anyway? How could a God who's loving allow all this to happen? It's because they've been programmed to think in a certain way. Millions of years, billions of years, millions of years, billions of years. Evolution's a fact. Therefore, by implication, death and disease and extinctions and bloodshed have always been around. You can't escape it if those time frames are right. So long before mankind ever appear, appeared, it, there's always been this death and disease. You get it? That, subconsciously, that's the framework, the viewpoint through which they view God. God is the author of death. No wonder they're mad at God. No wonder the Bible starts to seem irrelevant. But that's not what God's word tells us. It says, we were created to live forever, but we said to God, I don't want you to be God, I want to be God. I don't want to obey your rules, I want to make the rules. There can't be two gods. God is also totally just. There has to be penalty for rebellion and sin. The penalty is death. So God could have wiped out the universe and started over, but he said, no. I'm just going to destroy my perfect, absolutely pristine creation because of what you've done so that you will not live forever biologically and be forever separated from me, the entity of perfect purity and holiness. Because that's what happened as soon as we sinned. We were separated. So you see, Christianity starts up here with a real event that really happened in real time and real space not that long ago. It doesn't start down here with Christ on the cross. And then God said in that action a plan where he would enter into the box he made to take that penalty of death upon himself so that we could come back into fellowship with him. Because we can never pay enough to pay for our sins. But he can. You get it? But you've got to treat it as reality, as a real event, in normal conversations. 
But then you got to explain the rock layers and the fossils and the ice age. Where does the ice age fit in? Where do dinosaurs fit in? How did the continents get to the way they look like? How do the river valleys get to the way they look like? If you can't explain these things, everything else you tell somebody is non-credible. I don't care how much you talk about intelligent design. If you can't fit that design into a real timeline of Earth history, it is just more nonsense. That's why at the time of Darwin, when the scientists were talking about Paley's watch and a watch has to have a watchmaker, they still lost the culture. People still ended up believing in evolution because there seemed to be another explanation for things, and they'd already bought into huge timelines where death and disease had always been around. So it doesn't matter if there's a designer, it doesn't fit into any real Earth history. But the Bible spends more time talking about this flood than it did creation. That's geology. It's the foundation for understanding all geology. Can you imagine if our school systems taught about that? It would drive people toward wondering to know who is this God. And it's our job to get the truth out there. You see, this whole day, every month that you come here, it's not about learning more science. It's not about learning more evidence. It's really about the attack of Satan upon the trustworthiness of God himself. And God identifies himself with his word. In the beginning there was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. Satan's initial attack upon mankind was to cast doubt upon God's trustworthiness of his statements. That's all that's going on. And the more we can learn and the more effectively we can simply, in simple terms, with conviction, communicate what the truth of the past is, the more people are going to come to trust God's word. Okay, now that was all just introduction. And then the most momentous event, I don't mean to minimize this, the most momentous event of the entire universe, the maker of the box, entered into the box for a specific reason, to take our sins upon himself. Now, the Great Commission is also in the Old Testament, and this is it. And it's not, you know, evangelism is really kind of simple. This is Psalm 145. It says, one generation shall praise the works of God to the next. They shall declare God's mighty acts. Now, in about two minutes, that's what I just did. I just treated the great acts of God, creation, Bringing death so we wouldn't forever be separated from God. That was actually an act of love into creation. The worldwide flood, so there would be the consequences of sin locked into the very rock layers we walk on. Every person in every generation throughout time just has to look down at the rocks and know the consequences of sin are death because they're filled with billions of dead things there as a result of our rebellion against God. It's, it, that was even an act of love. Those are the mighty acts of God. We treat them as real. We talk about them. We point out to people how they're being misled. We are doing evangelism. We're pointing people to the reality of God's word. And it will lead them in the direction of wanting to know more about who is this God. Now, here's where this talk comes from. About four years ago, I was invited to a high school, public high school, world history class. All right? Now, it was the beginning of the year. The students were given an assignment. It, remember, it's world history, seniors, top dogs, okay? They're bored anyway, and, and I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, so the teacher says, well, we'll make a group activity. You're going to break into groups, and each one of you are going to give a presentation of some cultural story or idea of where mankind came from to the rest of the class. So you had a group that came, and uh, basically they gave this story, you know, the evolution story, and that's how I treat it as a story where one creature turned into another and stars formed themselves and and so on and mankind finally appeared. And it's to them, it's fact, because it's what they hear in the science classes. And science has replaced God as a source of reality in our culture today. So for most of those students, this wasn't a story, it was fact. Another group of students talked about aliens brought DNA to Earth, and that's what seeded the Earth and caused life to form on Earth. Another group talked about the Hindu culture of, uh, you know, it's, it's been around forever with, uh, you know, the Brahma brought us about and, uh, you know, originally there was the earth on an elephant's back and so on. Well, a girl in the class had heard me speak in her church and she went to her teacher and said, can we give half of our time to a speaker who will come support the Christian viewpoint of where people came from uh, with, with some evidence? Uh, and they each had 20 minutes and the teacher said, sure, you can have half your time. So I have 10 minutes 
to totally change the worldview and perception of reality of a group of 35 senior high school bored students who have been trained for 12 or more years of their life that evolution is an absolute fact and natural processes have made us. All right? Impossible mission. And I'm thinking, well, I can, I, can, I can throw some of these really pithy facts for design at them. Or I could give them you know, just a few evidences that some of the stuff they've been taught is wrong. But then they're going to turn around and they're going to get hour and hour after hour of teaching that totally contradicts what I've just said and how effective is that going to be anyway. Well, God is not limited by time. It's kind of neat as we go through this to see what happened. And, and I'm going to kind of uh, bring that some, some of the things I was observing as I was talking out. But I'm going to give you like a 45-minute long version of what I only had 10 minutes to talk about. Uh, but I had received a book... Um, about a month earlier from a good friend in Minneapolis, uh, Twin Cities Creation Science Association had sent me this book, uh, and it was called The Red Record. In the Native American language, it was called The Wolam Olam, okay, uh, which is translated the, the record of the red people. Um, and I'll tell you how it all came about as we work our way through the introduction, but I thought I was startled. I, w- I was st- Stunned the parallel between this document that came from the Native American Indians and what the Christian word of God tells us about where everything came from. Uh, The parallel was absolutely stunning. And I thought, instead of just telling these kids about the Bible, I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to lay out a totally different document that that talks about the same sort of things. And then I'm going to tie it together at the end. Now, the girl, in her 10 minutes, she actually read through Genesis chapter 1 verbatim, then read selections out of Genesis chapter 3 verbatim, and then, to my horror, remember, we're trying to get these kids to see the truth, she had copied coloring book pages of Adam and Eve, and she gave her out some crayons and coloring book pages, said, this is your activity. Now, it's my turn to teach them what they just heard, and they're about to color on a kid's coloring book is the truth, all right? So I'm up. Well, first of all, I wanted to lay some groundwork. So I said, you know, you guys are in world history class, but this isn't just about history. And by the way, as I'm starting out, high school seniors, last year of school, they're slouched down in their chairs. You know, you can barely see their heads above their desks. They're fold, their arms are folded. They look bored and skeptical. Okay, that's my audience. Uh, but I said... You know, it's not just about history because what you think today is based on what you've been told in the past. What you believe right now about yourself and and things that are going on in your life is based on what you believe about the past. I mean, the reason you know a one is a one and one plus one is two is because you have been told that. So everything you believe is actually based on what you've been told. So it's really important to understand history and what it shows. And furthermore... Life is really about the big questions, all right? Big questions like, where did everything come from? Like, why is there death? Why is there evil in this world? How do you fix what's wrong with the world? What is your purpose on life? You see, how you answer those questions determine what your priorities are going to be, what you're going to do, how you're going to act, what you believe. Now, one of the stories you hoarded about where you came from was the idea that evolution made us, that basically gas from stars turned into us. Well, if that's true, then how can there really be a purpose? I mean, death's here because it's always been around. If that's true, there's always been death and disease and bloodshed, and it's just the way things are. Where does God fit into that anyway? And if that's true, how do you fix what's wrong with the world? You just must have to train yourself better. You just got to try harder to be a better person. You just got to train the next generation. Have schools at younger and younger ages. Start putting these one-year-olds in school and maybe we can have a better culture. You know what? It's never worked in the history of this planet. Every culture that's ever existed has decayed, deteriorated, and fallen apart and destroyed itself or others. You're in a world cluster class. That's what you're going to see. So you're naive to think it's going to be different today. And we see our culture deteriorating as we really are honest with ourselves. And last, what's your purpose in life if that story is true? You really can't say you have been made for a purpose. So you better just get whatever you can out of this life because you're going to die and turn back into worm food when it's all over. That's the consequence of taking that 
story to its natural consequences. And then I walked them through this very quickly, much more quickly than I did with you. And I said, look at the Bible as simply a model that helps us understand where things came from in a different way. Biology, geology, why death exists? Because we rebelled against the box maker. Now look at those same questions. You know, where to come from? Because somebody who knows us made us specifically. Why is there death? Because we rebelled against that maker. How do we fix what's wrong? You fix what's wrong with every single human heart. We can't fix ourselves. We have to have the one who made us fix us. And last, what's our purpose? You figure out what you were made for. What are your passions? What are your talents? What are your abilities? And then serve the one who made you. You will have an incredibly exciting, fulfilling life. You know what? When you're honest with kids, they started to sit up. They started to pay attention. They started to act interested because they was reasoning with them with reality and not talking down to them at all. Now, next I said, you, instead of talking specifically about that model from the Bible, I want to show you another account where we see those same concepts. It's totally independent of the Bible. Now, if those things I talked about are true, God literally made different kinds of animals, death is here literally because of our actions, that there really has been this literal worldwide flood, and people spread out across the globe after this flood, there's certain implications. It means that everybody on this planet has to be related, and not that long ago. I mean, not, we're talking, not talking millions and billions of years, fairly recently since that flood, all the cultures developed. It means the Egyptians, the Incas, the Chinese, they sprang into existence shortly after this flood, and that's where they came from. And it means there ought to be some sort of a memory of this flood and these events that happened before the flood throughout these cultures. So I'm going to take you to a different culture than developed the Bible, which was the Middle Eastern, you know, Israeli culture. Uh, I'm going to take you to the Native American Indians. Now, the Delaware Indian were originally considered the most powerful tribe in North America. Okay? They're widely acknowledged by folks who have studied this stuff as what's called the grandfather tribe. Their, their very name for themselves is the Lanai Lanape, which is translated the original people. So they call themselves the original people. And many and many of the other tribes, you know, the Hopis and the Cherokees and, and uh, you know, the Pawnees clear down in Florida, they can kind of be traced back as, as these original people migrated down from the northwest across North America. They ended up in the Delaware area by the time the Europeans in the 16, 15, 1600s arrived in America and found them. They were, the, the main original people were in Delaware area, so they were called the Delaware Indians. Uh, but they were known to have come from the northwest. Now, they also were like the record people, keepers of the Indian nations. You know, the Israelis kept meticulous ancestral records of their past. Well, so did the Delawares. Um, and they divided themselves into various clans. And they used a form of, kind of think of hieroglyphics um, to, to keep their records. Now, here's the book that this talk comes from. Um, it's written by a man named David McCutcheon. It's out of print, um, and it pops up on Amazon as a used book um, all the time. And, and just keep an eye on it, and if you want it, you, sometimes you'll see the price higher, sometimes lower. Um, but in the beginning of the book, he records you know, how this document came about, the history of it. Turns out, in the early 1800s, there was a doctor by the name of Dr. Ward, he was traveling through the wilderness of America. Now, there weren't even states that Ohio was a territory, Indiana was a territory, Kentucky was a territory still. Um, and he was going through the Indiana Territory, came across an Indian tribe who had caught some disease, wasn't even specified what it was, and they were dying. Um, the more, more Native Americans were wiped out by diseases they didn't have an immunity to than by war, uh, okay? Uh, but he nursed them back to health, all right? and spent weeks with them. And in gratitude, the ones that survived gave him their most valuable document, which was this record of all of human history. Um, and then it came right up to the, the, the late uh, 16, 1700s. And it got more and more detailed as it got closer and closer to modern times. It was very sketchy early on, but it's, it's what is uh, revealed there that is so interesting. Now, it 
predate from what's in it and i'm going to talk there's a bunch of things inside that testify to what i believe show this couldn't have just been made up by somebody wanting to put a bunch of christian doc, doctrines into a document uh but some of the stuff in it predates christianity it's like stuff older than you find in the book of job it talks about the origin of the universe it talks about the origin of humanity it talks about the where death and evil comes from it talks about a world restructuring flood uh, and, then, and then it describes the dispersion of humanity after this flood, and then it gets more detailed as it starts to talk about the tribes and the leaders and the kings and the wars and the battles that they moved across America, and we get closer in time. The document was carved on um, typically um, uh, birch bark, because birch is filled with oil and it doesn't rot very easily, and it will last for decades, and then it would be recarved and passed from generation to generation. And it had key symbols which were tied to, to, to key words, all right? And then those words were like remembrances that allowed them generation after generation after generation for decade after decade, century after century, to pass these things down to the next generation. Now, before I get into the document, I, I want to emphasize that book, The Red Record, and the original document were not translated by Christians. They didn't have an axe to grind. They didn't have a viewpoint to promote they were just doing the best they could to translate this valuable artifact that had been passed on to them by Christians. And by the way, the doctor didn't have a clue what to do with it, so he gave it to a man named um, Constantine, or, yeah, Constantine Rafinski. Uh, he's a French linguist working at the University of Transylvania in Kentucky. He spent 30 years translating this document. He was a linguistics genius, worked with Moravian monks from the 1700s that had worked with the Indians, tried to figure out what the phrases and the words meant, uh, translated it, and it just kind of disappeared in the middle 1800s. Nothing came of it. Um, it was retranslated early in the 1900s, then David McCutcheon found the documents, was intrigued, and put out this book in the 1970s. Now, here's David McCutcheon's introduction to this early parts of this book, all right? He says, the Wolam Olam, or the Red Record, opens with an account of the myth of creation an account generally consistent with other Native American versions, all right? Now, that's the same way most Christians out there treat God's Word. They consider Genesis chapters 1 through 11 just a myth, just a story, just something taught around a campfire, and they haven't bothered to learn any of the evidence that supports the reality that it means what it says. Uh, so he's just He's not saying it's even true. He's just saying this is the way it's translated. And it was endorsed by the uh, Delaware Indian um, Council uh, right up almost to the early 2000s. Now, things have changed since then. And, and during question and answer, we can talk about why I think things changed. But the point is, those closest to it, those who translated it originally, those who understood what it said, they had no problem that it meant what it said and it was a, a genuine document. Now, here's what it looked like. The original has been lost. This is a reconstruction based on the notes uh, from Rafinski's original translation notebook. Okay? It was just a series of symbols that were carved. Now, I'm going to walk you through them, all right? We take, and then we'll take a break, and I'm going to get into some implications and teaching of the evidence for creation. Here's the first symbol, all right? And there were three key words tied to it. And this is the translation on the right. And this is why we'll walk through the whole document. At the beginning, the sea everywhere covered the earth. All right? So that's how they start with the concept of where everything came from. There was this sea everywhere. And above it extended a swirling cloud. So you get this idea of this kind of chaos, swirling cloud of water. And within it, the great spirit moved. All right? And who is this great spirit? What are his characteristics? He is primordial. He's before time. He's everlasting. He's invisible. And he's everywhere at the same time. This great spirit now did something. Isn't that interesting? What are the characteristics of God? They got them nailed. Now remember, keep in mind as I'm talking about this, where this came from. There really was a creation of people. There really was a, a catastrophe that brought judgment upon this earth, and one family was survived through it. And then from that family, Noah, all the people gathered. There was the Tower of Babel. They were, didn't spread out like they were told. Their languages were changed, and they, they scattered across the earth as different people groups. But 
there, Noah would have brought with him knowledge and documents from before that time, all the way going all the way back to Adam. And these people would have taken with them knowledge of these events of early creation all the way back to Adam. But with time, they would have gotten distorted in their individual cultures. But that's what we're seeing. That's why these concepts are there, because those people came from Adam, that went to Noah, that went to them, that then spread over into North America. Okay, next symbol. So what does this great spirit do? He brings forth sky, then earth. He brings forth clouds, then heavens. Notice the order. He brings forth day, then night, then he brings forth stars. And he brings forth all these things to move in harmony. All right, it's describing a perfect creation, and it'll get more specific. And then stirred to action, a strong winds blow, and they clear the sky in rapid streams, and as pure as snow, land rises out of the water to be inhabited. Okay, that's the, I mean, that doesn't send a chill up and down your spine. This is not the Bible, but it's a totally independent parallel version of what we read as the truth. So I'm going to summarize each section. You've got God who creates from a watery chaos a swirling cloud, and here's his characteristics. He exists before time. He's eternal. He's a spirit being. He's present everywhere, and he's what made everything else. He, so what's he make? He makes day and then night. Specifically, it names that. He makes sky and earth. Specifically, it names those separate things. He makes the heavens and stars. Later on, it's listed in the document. Then he separates the sky from the earth and the land from the water. Sound familiar? Okay, let's walk our way on to the next section. So again, the great spirit uh, he created. He created creator spirits. wonder what that is. Angels come to my mind. Maybe the order's not right, but it's kind of interesting it's in there. Spirit beings. And he makes living beings. It's kind of a summary of the previous section. And how does he make these living beings? He makes them immortal. People were made to live biologically forever. And honestly, scientists still have trouble figuring out why we die. It's like our cells divide and they divide and they divide and they divide. And they realize it's because mistakes build up. But if a cell made a perfect copy of itself, there would never be a reason for any of us to ever age or die. So biologically, it's not at all a strange concept that we could live forever. It's just, it doesn't work that way anymore. Um, so we're made to be immortal, and souls were given for things. And then the spirit ancestor, the grandfather of men, so another title for God, he gave the first mother, the mother of life, it names characteristics of, of, of male and female here, uh, but what did he do? This great spirit, he made fish, he made turtles, he made beasts, he made birds. All right, They're naming different things that were made, different kinds of animals. Remember, it's not the Bible, so there's going to be distortions, but it's kind of interesting, the concepts you see. But then, now they've got to explain things they don't like. All right, You've got to figure out, why do these things I don't like come from? So they blame it on a bad spirit. They say a bad spirit brought forth bad things. Ooh, nasty stuff. Snake. And what's the worst thing someone running around in a loincloth out in the forest can think of? Flies and mosquitoes. He made flies and mosquitoes. It's, it's kind of interesting. I think I'd put them up there high on the list. So, you, overview again. you got a God who created life. He made people with souls meant to live forever. Names a series of animals, not you know, not exhaustive, but it makes the point. Uh, they've got to explain bad things, so they blame that on a bad, or bad animals, so they blame that on a bad spirit and consider them bad. And now we go on. So here's how things were when the creation is done, all right? Friends were all things with each other, all right? Now, even in the 1800s when this document was made, People were already kind of starting to get inundated with these huge periods of time idea and that death and disease and problems have always been around. So this is not a, a scientific scholarly thought at that time period when this document was translated, all right? So friends were everything with each other. And the benefactor and the helpful spirits were busy, all right? The angels and God. And these ancestors, these first men, they were alone so the first women were brought to them. Isn't that interesting? Why would they say that? Because that's what the Bible tells us. Men followed by women were created second. God wanted the man to know nothing would bring contentment like a helpmate designed specifically for him from God. 
man and woman were designed specifically to complete each other. And man needed to look at everything else that had been made before he would realize that was true. So hungry for the first food, these ancestors were. So they gathered it. So the original people didn't eat meat. They ate the food that they gathered. That's how they were designed. And here's the condition on earth at that point. Everything was delighted. All things were carefree. All things were happy. But then, very secretly at the end, an evil snake, a sorcerer, came to earth. What do you know about that? A snake shows up in this document. It comes to deceive mankind. Now, all these ancient cultures, all these pagan cultures in Africa and South America and the ancient Babylonians, they worshipped images of a snake. It always shows up in their ancient religious um, viewpoints. The mound builders of ancient America, they built mounds in the shape of snakes because it's a reality of something that seems to have happened back there in history. So wickedness and wrongfulness and criminal acts came about and black weather came and sickness came and death came after this evil entity entered into creation. And all of this was long ago and far beyond the great flood, the first world that then was. So they're dividing a clear distinction in world history. There was what happened before the flood, and there's what happened after the flood. An enormous marker in world history was this flood event. World history, not some little local event, all right? Because all people came from people that escaped that flood. By the way, the kids are fascinated. They're seeing the parallel, all right? They're starting to sit up. They're wide awake. But I was out of time. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, can, I, I know I'm out of time, and I can wrap this up in like the next minute, but I'll have to skip a bunch of the stuff in the document. The teacher said, so you, tell you what, we'll delay the next presentation until tomorrow. You take the next 20 minutes. And it was so cool. <laughs> so now you've got time to finish. God just does his stuff. All right. Um, so... Summarizing, evil enters creation. There used to be harmony everywhere. We were vegetarians. Man was created. Woman was brought to him. A snake brings corruption. Mankind becomes sinful. Death enters. And there's this hint that a great flood is coming. So next section of their history of reality. Now long ago, in the time of this mighty serpent, uh, there were men and there were evil beings. All right? I don't know what that is, but they're saying there's people and then there's other beings that are evil, uh, okay? The Bible talks about that too. Angels, Nephilim, things that went on at this time of human history. And the mighty serpent who was an enemy to the ancestors, and the ancestors grew to hate it. So there was just this hatred going on. And both fought, both mankind and, and whatever spiritual stuff is going on here. And they both did wrong, and there was no peace and here it describes the world at that time. And homes were destroyed. And there was murders and there was bloodshed. Kind of sound like Genesis describing the Bible before the flood was sent. Evil everywhere. All right? And the mighty serpent resolving that men and living things were to be destroyed. Now here's a departure from scripture. They blame what's about to happen on the serpent. Well, ultimately it was our fault. We were the ones who followed evil. We brought it upon ourselves. But God was the one that wanted for time immemorial for there to be one judgment that showed us the consequence of sin is death. So every generation didn't have to bring another judgment. In the next generation, he's got to bring another judgment. In the next generation, he's got to bring another judgment. He locked it into the very rock layers with the worldwide flood. Okay? So, they brought snakes, and there were sea monsters, and a snaking flood. Now, the only place in this document, and it goes on for like another 20 or 30 pages of symbols that are, that are translated, all right? The only place in the document that it uses this kind of language is when it describes this world-shattering flood. It's flooding and flooding, filling and filling, smashing and smashing, drowning and drowning. Does that sound like a little, some little local event? This is a world restructuring catastrophe that they're describing. And now enter the hero. At Turtle Island was Ninabush, the great hare. He just took the, that name upon himself. And what's his title? This man is the grandfather to all life. This man is the grandfather to all humanity. 
Everybody came from him. That's their concept. And steadily creeping, the turtle, he went to the rescue. So it's kind of a little epic coming up here. So men were evil. The serpent and mankind are both held responsible in this document. There's violence everywhere. There's an enormous flood coming. And one man saves humans and becomes the ancestor to every other person on this planet. And now here comes the epic. Living things and people. Uh, they went forth and there were rapids and shallows and they were struggling downstream to where the grandfather, the turtle, was. They were trying to come to him. And there were sea monsters and there were many. And some people, they ate the people. And then the spirit daughter, they helped build a boat. Okay, that's kind of interesting. He's saved by a boat. And here and there, one came, one came. Somehow things came two at a time to this boat. Interesting concept. Um, and they came to be helped. Ninabush, Ninabush, grandfather of all, ancient grandfather, turtle grandfather, the people here, the people there, the turtle people, they were united, they were frightened. Key verse, key point, and they prayed. They prayed. And they were saved, and the world was restored, and the flood dried, and the valleys and the hollows dried, and the peril was over, it was over. Okay. So, you've got a hero named, he saves the people, there's an involvement of a boat that saves the people, there's a reference at least to things two at a time, uh, and there's a single man, and the flood ends. So, after the flood, the Lenape, the true men, the turtle people, they were crowded together. They were living in cave shelters. Now, by the way, when we find cavemen, when we find people that are variations of human beings that lived in an incredibly harsh period of Earth history, they're there because after the flood, there was an ice age. After we take a break, I'm going to come back to that, all right? You've got to be able to explain to people, how does the ice age fit into the Bible? Because you don't hear it mentioned or talked about in the Bible. So therefore, Bible must not deal with reality. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We'll get to that. Okay, but there are people living in caves. That's probably what where the Neanderthals were. I mean, if you're in a very cold, freezing, snowy environment, you're going to find shelter, and it's probably going to be a cave. Well, this is how they describe their home after the flood. This was conditions where they were living after the flood. Their home was icy. Their home was snowy. Their home was windy. Their home was freezing. All right? Now... The next verse is the thing out of this entire document that made me realize, wow, this couldn't have been forged. This couldn't have been made up in the early 1800s. First of all, in the early 1800s, there was nobody out there in the scientific community that knew about the Ice Age. They thought things had pretty much went along as they always had. Uniformitarianism, things going on today, explain things from the past, was the mindset. And they didn't realize there was the globe was essentially all the northern southern latitudes were covered by each sheets of ice up to a mile thick or more, all right? But there's the description of the kind of world they were living in in this document. And then it says this, to the north slope, to have less cold, many big game herds went. Now think about that. Why would a bunch of animals head north to Canada because it's warmer up there? That's what it's saying. Why would someone in forging a document to try to support a bunch of Christian doctrines put something totally uncredible in that document like that? He's just simply translating what it says. This is an enormous key to both the credibility of this document and to the Bible itself. And I'm going to show you how it all fits together in a little bit. So, to be strong, now here's just a little bit of chest pounding, to be strong, to be rich, the travelers from the builders, the hunters, broke away. Where in the Bible does it talk about a bunch of people gathering together to do building? After the flood, the Tower of Babel. What happened after that? People split apart and spread across the earth. And then they say, the strongest of all, the best of all, the holiest of all, the hunters are, because that's them. That's the Delaware Indians. North, south, east, west, the hunters and the explorers went. Okay, so summarizing. We are now, after the flood, there's an ice age. People, many of them, are finding shelter in caves. There's ice everywhere. It's cold. There's breeze blowing. The travelers leave the builders. Animals 
They follow animals who are migrating north where it's less cold to the north, all right? And the people become hunters and explorers heading in a very direction and breaking into people groups. Now, the rest of the document is an account of them moving through the frozen ice fields of the north and then down the Pacific Northwest, ending up in the Washington, Oregon area and a little bit of Canada, moving across the big mountains that are described into the plains and all the way into the east. And that's the majority of the document. But I'm dealing with origins here, so this is where I'm going to stop as far as what's described. Now, just a little bit of additional information. Every culture in the world has an account of a flood. You would expect that. This is a key change of all human history. This entire globe was totally devastated, destroyed, and restructured. And you, you up here in this area can understand that because of the many local, teeny little examples that were going on a worldwide basis. The Eskimos don't talk about God judged the world because he froze it out. You would think they would. No, their explanation for why things are the way they are is there was a flood upon the earth. The Assyrians or the uh, people living in, um, uh, down in, in the Russia area where they have earthquakes, like every 10 years they have earthquakes, very unstable area, they don't have legends of God bringing an earthquake to judge the earth. It's always a story of a flood because all the cultures came from Noah, they spread out, they took with them a remembrance, it becomes very distorted, talking about baskets, floating baskets instead of boats, but the mem remembrance is still there. Now, there is an enormous mystery in science, and it, it won, many of them actually, because they're approaching things from a non-biblical viewpoint, so they don't have the right answers, so there's all these things that can be explained. There's about 20 different theories for what caused the last ice age, and they think there's been about 18 of them, all right? Well, they're wrong, and I'll explain why. Um, but the reason there's a bunch of theories is because none of them work. If one of them explained it really, really well, there wouldn't be 17 other competing, competing theories. None of them explain it. Because to have an ice age, you have to evaporate enormous amounts of water from the ocean. Think how long it takes to boil a pan of water on your stove. You have to pour tons of BTUs into it just to boil a pan of water and get it to evaporate. Now think about evaporating the oceans to where the levels drop 400 feet. That's how much water was evaporated during the ice age. Where'd all that heat come from? And in northern Siberia, there's about a million woolly mammoths that are buried, all right? They're so fresh, they're, they're buried not under huge sheets of ice, but in permafrost, only a feet or tens of feet deep, okay? Uh, they're so fresh, dog sled teams can, can fall them out and they'll eat the meat and it's perfectly edible. Some of them have been found with vegetation in their stomachs that only grow in tropical areas. And some of them have been found standing in an upright position. How do you kill a critter and it dies and it doesn't fall over? They're surrounded by like mounds of dust and muck, but how did it get there and how did they die and, and what's going on? Let's get into the aftermath of the flood and tie it all together in the next 10 minutes. Um, uh, you know, I've noticed there's a lot of kind of infighting amongst the creation community, even the young, um, real, there's been a real worldwide flood community because we can get real tied to our own mechanism of what we think drove the flood and how we think things went. And we can pour a lot of effort into coming up with our theories. And we, I've even seen some viciousness going on between, uh, you know, different camps of describing what mechanism drove the flood. Um, and I try to just kind of avoid that because we don't know for sure what happened in the past other than the fact there absolutely had to have been one. But all of these mechanisms have to come to one conclusion. There had to have been enormous amounts of energy being poured into the oceans of the world. There had to have been lots of volcanism going on. There had to have been lots of land movement going on. And all that causes frictional heat and the release of heat that would have warmed up the ocean waters. At the end of the flood, those ocean waters had to have been probably 30 or 40 or 50 degrees warmer the entire oceans of the world than they are today or they were before the flood. Think about the Arctic Ocean being 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the whole ocean, all right? That's the model to get in your head to realize what had to have been going on during the flood. The waters were left much, much warmer. Um, this would have caused massive extinctions, by the way, 
of animals in the ocean. 95% of all fossils we find in the rock layers of this earth, which were laid down by flood waters, are sea creatures. The ocean's salinity probably changed. The ocean's temperature definitely changed. Enormous numbers of creatures went totally extinct. And others were buried by the billions in the rock layers. And it's exactly what we find. And the movement of the water and the processes happening, the cavitation and massive lands and things like the, the, the big flood that cor- carved out the uh, Columbia River Gorge, those were happening on a regional worldwide scale depositing these rock layers. All right? Now, what's the consequence of the oceans of the world being much warmer? 70, 80, 90 degrees Fahrenheit versus today, they're, the average ocean temperature is probably in the 40s if you look worldwide. The weather of our planet is driven by evaporation of water from the oceans. If the water temperature is warmer, there's much more evaporation, orders of magnitude higher. You plug warmer oceans into any climate model and you will guarantee an ice age on this planet. It's kind of, an oxy- it's kind of in- non-intuitive. To get an ice age, you gotta have hotter water in the oceans because that causes lots more cloud cover, which reflects more sunlight, which you know keeps the atmosphere from being as warm, and the evaporation's gotta go somewhere so it travels to the polar caps where it condenses and comes down to snow. So immediately after the uh, worldwide flood, um, you would have more cloudy skies, and the forecast in Canada tomorrow would be snow. Next week, snow. Next month, snow. Next year, snow. Next decade, snow. Snow, day after day, week after week, month after month, decade after decade, century after century, the forecast in Canada is snow. Because the weather pattern is going to carry that moisture, it's going to condense, and it's going to come down as snow. And it's going to continue until the oceans cool down. And the oceans are so large, it would take centuries to suck that much heat out of the water. So you absolutely are guaranteed an ice age immediately following a global, worldwide, massive energy input to the ocean water's flood. All right, so that's what's going on. That's why it's described in in the Red Record document. Now, here's where I get to that mystery. As I said, they've they've pulled out an estimated 60,000 ivory tusks from this area, semi-tropical vegetation or sometimes even tropical vegetation. Okay. In their stomachs, they're often buried in mounds of dust, relatively undecayed, um, and, and so on. Now, the land which these woolly mammoths are buried on top of, the permafrost, okay, that they're buried in, is sedimentary rock. They had to have lived after the flood. They were there in an environment where they used to be alive. They aren't like ripped up and transported and plopped down on top of this rock. They were living there, okay? We look foolish when we deny what is is absolutely obvious evidence, okay? So if we come up with a theory that says they were just thrown there by the flood, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't work. It's obviously wrong to anybody you're trying to explain that to. They had to have lived after the flood. So how do you get millions of creatures up there where it's permanently frozen in Siberia mainly after the flood? Well, this is what is is going on. And I'm going to come back to the standing position because that's even more of a mystery. After the flood, the tundra for hundreds of miles inland from the ocean would have been very moderate, okay? Ardanica, the coastline of Ardanica, would have been exposed for hundreds of years, maybe four, five, six hundred years after the flood. The ocean water is very warm. For a while, it was like the Bahamas, and then it slowly cooled down, and it ended up more like the coast of California, the coast of Oregon, a very temperate uh, area even up here, but even warmer. And it took hundreds of years for that to cool down after the flood. Meanwhile, if you start with two elephant-type creatures, and by the way, God sent the animals to the ark, because if it had been Noah that would have selected the dog kind, um, I don't know, he might have been kind of fond of something that looked like a chihuahua, and he might have brought chihuahuas on, And we'd never have all the variety of dogs we find on the planet today because a chihuahua is just a tiny little subset of the information that came from a gray wolf. The wolf has every bit of genetic information needed already there to make all of the foxes and the coyotes and every breed of dog on the planet today. 
it's just that information gets sorted out and sorted out, and you get rid of anything that doesn't look like a wolf, and you get a smaller animal, and you get rid of more, and you get a smaller animal, and you get rid of more, and you finally end up with this little critter that couldn't possibly survive in the wild with a huge, you know, high-domed forehead. It's not the Einstein of the animal kingdom. It's just you've gotten rid of everything useful, and you end up with a chihuahua. Sorry for those who love chihuahuas. <laughs> and someone had one, so I just like to make fun of them. They're so cute. But anyway, so you start out with two elephant-type creatures. They separate into woolly mammoths and mastodons and Indian elephants and African elephants. And for whatever reason, the woolly mammoths head north. They probably were starting to move through fields of ice to get to a warmer climate. They ended up all the way north where they're near the ocean, and there's a very warm microclimate because it's protected by the warm ocean water. And two within five years becomes four, and within 10 years becomes eight, and within you know, 20 years becomes 16. Turns out within a few hundred years, you can have a million elephants. It doesn't take that long. That's how fast population growth happens. Uh, so you get all these elephants roaming around in a fairly temperate area that's up near the ocean. But to the south of them is where you're further away from the warm ocean water. The water's coming, it's condensing, it's falling as snowfall, and it builds up, and more snowfall, and it builds up, and more snowfall. It takes about a 10 foot of snow to make a foot of ice. So for a mile thick glacier, it would have taken 10 miles of snow. Okay, that's a lot of snow. I think we have problems this winter out east. It's a lot of snow. And furthermore, the worldwide climate was wetter for hundreds of years after the flood. If in a straightforward way, biblically, you had a flood about 40, 4,350 years ago, and there's some debate whether that's the right date, but I'll take that one because it really does work. And then you have cultures developing in the Tower of Babel. And honestly, by 3,900 years ago, when Abraham arrived in Egypt, once again, you look at population studies, you can show how there could have easily been millions of people just in Egypt that quick after the flood. It works statistically. Um, Egypt was actually not a desert when Egypt was flourishing. We now know that. It was a very lush environment. Israel, 3,500 years ago, was called the land flowing with milk and honey. They brought back grapes, uh, you know, bunches of grapes that were so big you had to carry them between a pole on your shoulder. Why? Today it's a desert. It's because the whole world 3,500 to 4,500 years ago was a very lush, wet environment in the, the equatorial regions, but further north, ice was building up in huge ice sheets, and further north of that, you're closer to the ocean, and it was a fairly temperate environment. So literally, animals early in the flood, early in the ice age, could have traveled north where it was more warm. It totally fits a biblical viewpoint of what was going on on this planet. Well, as centuries passed, the ocean water cools down, the ocean water cools down, the ocean water cools down. Today, Hudson Bay, when it freezes over an enormous area over there off of, the, off of Maine, up in Upper Canada, I am told it can drop um, you know, subcritical, so it gets below the freezing point of water, and at one moment, it can crystallize and overnight the entire surface of the bay for hundreds of thousands of miles can freeze over. And when that happens, there can be a temperature drop of 60, 70, 80 degrees almost instantaneously um, given the right weather patterns. So you can have an enormous, once the water, open water freezes over, drop in temperature, and there may be other things happening. There could have been a minor catastrophe on Earth at that time. There could have been comets going on. There's all sorts of possible explanations for a rapid temperature drop. But once the oceans froze over, they literally would have stayed frozen over in the Arctic Ocean area. So now you have a herds of millions of animals that were used to a fairly warm, maybe seasonal environment that's changing over the years. And at some point, they are trapped between enormous glaciers to the south and a frozen ocean to the north, and their environment has suddenly changed. And they're trapped. Meanwhile, I think there were, there were things like dust storms going on. Um, desert regions started to form because once the waterfall tapered off, and by the way, all of this, I think it's a pretty good model. It's out of Michael Ord's book called The Mystery of the Woolly Mammoths and the Bible. Okay? So it's a really well-written, well-documented book. Um, 
all of that stuff that was basically mud still hanging around on the surface of things, things are starting to settle down. We're talking hundreds of years, probably five, six hundred years after the flood. The oceans have cooled, the rainfall tapers off, desert regions start to form, but the prevailing winds is going to pick up all this now dried out sediment. And it's going to pick it up in huge dust storms that are going to swirl in various areas around the earth. Um, there are probably still massive weather patterns happening. And a lot of these elephants, or these mass woolly mammoths, they are surrounded by mounds of dust. Many of them have been shown to have suffocated. Um, it's possible that during this period of Earth history, right before or during this, this rapid change of, of climate, um, they, there was dust, swirling dust storms going on as the temperatures were dropping and dropping and dropping, and they literally were surrounded by mounds of dust, so when they died, they were in a standing position. Then stuff forms around them, ice, snow, whatever, and they end up being buried that way. By the way, th those elephants have three, four stomachs like a cow. One of them's a holding chamber where they can eat something and then they can pull it back up and chew on it. Um, and in that chamber, it can last for days without, maybe even a week, without having a massive amount of decay. So it's not like we had to put them in a bird's eye, a deep freeze chamber and within seconds freeze the mammoth. It could have taken a period of days or, or a week or more. Um, but the fact is they were frozen and they, they remained frozen. Now here's a map of the world that we now know what was going on during the Ice Age based on a lot of geological evidence. A little hard to see, but this is an enormous ice sheet, over a mile thick in many areas. Here's Europe all covered with ice sheets. Uh, here's uh, down below Siberia. You'll notice this green area is upper Siberia. This area along Alaska and over here is, is upper Alaska. The coastlines here are not, no higher elevation than the areas further south. But you'll notice they're green. Here's the Arctic Ocean, pretty much for the most part frozen over most of the year, parts of it, if not a large part of it. This area was never covered with ice during the Ice Age. Why not? Further south, you had mile thick layers of ice. Here you have an ice covered ocean. Why isn't there ice along the coastline? because the Ice Age was petering to an end by the time the ocean froze over and the ices were starting to, to retreat. Now what happened subsequent, you know, 36, 35, 3400 years ago, that time frame, there were still lots of, I mean, this planet's a complex place. There were probably periods of decades where the ice would advance forward and then there'd be a warming period and the ice would retreat backwards maybe for hundreds of miles, and then it would start to build up again over maybe over a hundred year period, and it would advance forward, and it would melt back, and advance, and melt back. And we see these ridges of rubble. And they are interpreted as multiple ice ages from the past. They're really just a consequence of multiple advances and retreats of the one great ice age that happened on this planet. See, it fits like a hand in a glove. All these mysteries of science, if you just take God's word to mean what it says, they fit together very, very well. But we train people in our schools to think about, you know, they core the ice cores and they see all these seams and they interpret each seam as a year, a season, instead of an individual storm. They may be a day instead of a year. And we're trained that they're, they're, they're mile thick cores of ice. So there had to have been huge periods of time. Well, I actually just read this back in the early 1980s. There was an article in Time magazine where a couple of businessmen from Tennessee had read about uh, a set of airplanes during World War II, a squadron. Um, I forget, what's the name of these airplanes? P-38s that was lost on the glacier in Greenland because they were flying over to Europe to, del to deliver them and, and they caught, caught in a snowstorm and they had to land. The pilots were rescued, but they had to abandon the airplanes. And these businessmen read this, so they thought, well, this is kind of cool. I bet they're still up there. Why don't we go find these airplanes? And this is a quote. They said, we will just dust the snow off the wings and fly them home. <laughs> All right? Now, they knew that was a little naive, but it's kind of colorful language, so that it was quoted in the article. Well, that was the early 19, uh, or late 1970s. This article was in 1980 when they finally, 10 years later, had finally succeeded after spending millions of dollars and 10 years of effort of one piece at a time extracting one of the airplanes from the ice in Greenland. 
And this is why they had so much trouble. Because the airplane was under 250 feet of ice. Remember what I said? It takes 10 feet of snow to create a foot of ice. So just since 1945, in one little spot in Greenland, when we're not having an ice age, there has been 2,500 foot of snow in just 50 years. All right? So think, there's no trouble at all explaining all the ice for the ice age in a very short period of time. Believing it took hundreds of thousands of years to create an ice age is what's ridiculous when you see things like this. I mean, that plane was literally 250 foot down, covered with snow that had turned to ice. And they, they had steam generators that melted the shaft, and then they melted away a big chamber, and then they pulled it apart a piece at a time, and finally got to fly their airplane home. Cost them quite a bit, but it's kind of a neat story. But the implications are huge. Okay, now this is where I'm going to wrap up. And, and then we'll do questions. And I want to talk about what the skeptics say about the red record, too, if there's no other questions. I finished with the students. They are absolutely enamored with what they've heard. They've all of a sudden seen a total... The Bible's been discredited in their minds. They just think it's a bunch of storytelling and a bunch of people sitting around a campfire that have come up with stories, and it's nonsense. I said, okay, you guys, you've just heard another account from history of where everything came from, why there's death, why the world looks the way it does, and the evidence that seems to just fit it really, really well from science. Suppose you go home today and you're texting on your cell phone, and you know you, you, know you shouldn't, but hey, your girlfriend called, and you happen to look up and there's an oak tree coming right at you. You're thinking, how does that oak tree know how to move? And <laughs> your car runs right into it. You didn't realize you were off the road. And the next thing you know, you're, you're kind of groggy, and, and you're waking up, and, the, and you, you realize you're in a hospital room, and the nurse runs out, and she comes back with the doctor, and they're all excited, and they say, you're awake, you're awake. And, and, and your, your mind is starting to clear, and, and your, your mouth is dry, and you say, last thing I remember, I, I, I know I must have hit a tree. What, what day is it? And, and they said, it's Thursday. I said, Thursday? That guy, he came to talk to my class about creation. It was Monday. You mean I've, I've been in the hospital for three days? And the doctor, he kind of hesitates. And he looks at you and he says, Well, son, actually you've been here for ten years. You've been in a coma for the last ten years. You wouldn't believe him. You absolutely, flat out, would not believe him. But now suppose... They put you in a wheelchair, and they wheel you down to the lobby, and you pull a newspaper out, and you look at the date, and it tells you the same thing. You have two independent sources of information that are giving you the same reality. See, that's all you've heard here today. Two independent sources of reality. It, it, it doesn't just double your confidence you have the truth. It puts it through the ceiling. That is the truth about the past of this planet. And then I, you know, the, by the way, we, we, the teacher let it go on past when the bell rang. We had questions and answers. We talked about the worldwide flood more. I gave every kid in that room one of the books, uh, you know, and I know they will read them because they were fascinated. But see what God does with these opportunities? When we present the great acts of God as reality and we're knowledgeable enough to have some evidence to support it up, it will change people's lives. And that's our job. And I hope this whole talk helped you today. Thank you so much. We'll do questions now. Now, these are the kind of things the scoffers say about this whole Red Record document. You can, you can Google the Red Record, you go to Wikipedia, and it treats the Red Record the same way the world treats the early parts of the Bible. The same set of philosophies and excuses. They deny its authenticity, they deny its authorship. Well, Moses didn't write the Old Testament, it's just a bunch of documents brought together by ancient scribes. That's what you'll hear in the academic community. Uh, they'll deny its historical collaboration. There's nothing, in, you can't collaborate the Bible historically, it's just a bunch of nonsense. Same sort of things are said. So keep that in mind. Second, the thing I'd like to note is that the people closest to the Red Record originally totally accepted it as an accurate, completely uh, honest, historical interpretation of what had been found. Um, those closest to the translation found no fault in it. Uh, it used linguistic work from hundreds of years before the document was found, and it contains 
all of these historical details that couldn't have been known at the moment of translation. They couldn't have known it would be warmer as animals headed north, and yet it's in the document. They, they didn't even know about the Ice Age, and yet it's very clearly in the document. And here's the stuff you'll see on, on the, the, the critics. Uh, that they say, well, there's no record of this Dr. Ward. We can't find him historical records. Doctors in the 1800s, by and large, were kind of like glorified dentists. There, there weren't major medical school certified doc Lots of people that called themselves doctors and did medicine wouldn't have had historical records. So it's an excuse to reject it. Um, they said there were various versions found in uh, Rafinsky's notes. Um, well, during his process of translation, obviously he would have been struggling with various interpretations and various uh, things. They used that as an excuse to reject his final document, the fact that he had early on various things. They object to the use of English words in the translation. Well, give me a break. It's a translation. Obviously, you're going to use the language you're most familiar with. Uh, they say some of those pictographs don't match the, pict you know, the, the pictograph type stuff they see in the Lenape people at that time period in the 1800s. But remember, this document came from way, 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 way further back. And they carried those original pictographs forward. So there's reasonable explanations for this. And last, the Native American Council withdrew its endorsement in 1997. That was the question that I wanted to get to. But look at what's going on. Native Americans are also strongly influenced by the educational system of the West. And there has been an increasing desire for them to go back to their roots, to, to have their own culture, their own people. This document seems to point out a tie between Western Christianity and Native Americans, and they don't want that. And, and they're people just like all the rest of us with their own set of perceptions, their own set of motivations, their own set of desires. So I, I'm just speculating. I can't know why people do things, but I have a feeling it was more of a social motivation kind of thing that caused them to withdraw their endorsement, not because it wasn't a good translation and it was endorsed originally. Uh, this is a quote, the Wollum Olam was treated as an accurate account by historians, anthropologists, and archaeologists for many years this is one of the top, most influential archaeologists of the 1900s, all the, the 1800s, the 19th century. A resolution um, was, 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 that accepted it was passed in 1980, and the Wola Molem was sung by my ancestors as they traveled thousands of years where the sun wakes up. I pray it will, will be heard throughout the um, Delaware Indians people. This was the Grand Chief in 1993. So repeatedly it was accepted believed to be authentic. The original founders believed to be authentic. It contains all sorts of in internal stuff that wouldn't be there if it wasn't authentic. Um, and yet, if it's authentic, it's that independent confirmation of biblical truth. The world can't have that. So they're going to throw excuses at it. And I think that's all you're going to see and read. And you're going to sort through what's evidence and what's just somebody else's reason to reject what's right in front of their face. Is there any scholarly article or publication that defends the record that one could point to an academic to, such as in a, you know, some, some um, reputable journal? The, the book, The Red Record, has extensive footnotes at the back, yeah. and there's extensive evidence up to support the authenticity of it internally. Mm -hmm. So you'd find it in the footnotes of the book itself. No. Are you uh, familiar with the publication Ancient American? Yeah, I am. Wonderful a group of people that are supporting those ancient American knowledge. Uh, it's not, of course, from a creationist perspective. No, it's not. But although the, you will find much information in there that does support it. That's why I said it's a great source of information. Uh, they've had a number of, of articles about the Red Record and, uh, and other tribes, too, by the way. I don't know if they're written. Uh, but there's a lot of supporting evidence in that publication if you go back through the archives. Yeah, that's good. So there's another source. It's the whole um, uh, intellectual organization that, that supports it. But once again, I come back to that internal references to things that couldn't have been known had the document been forged. Um, hi, I'm Kristen. I, I don't know too much about the language interpretation, but I saw that it was a Moravian missionary. How do we know he didn't just read into um, what the words that he is reading? Um... Once again, you look at, I, 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 just, I just have to assume the linguist was doing his work. You know, he looks at how the Moravians were translating other stuff, and it seemed to be accurate. 
So there probably is an assumption because he seems to have been honest with other stuff. He's being honest with, with these words too. Okay. But it's, it's a fair question. How receptive are the Christian universities to the red record? I struggled for 20 years. Why can't people see the absolute obvious? Now, in a way, I should know because I came out of school thinking evolution was a fact and, and the, the whole idea of creation was a bunch of religious nonsense because it's all I'd ever been taught. But the human brain is actually set up so that it can take the truth and it is capable of taking what is literally true right in front of your face and flipping it 180 degrees and you don't even know your brain is doing that. Um, and as part of this talk, I show a, a little film where your eyeball has a lens where it flips everything upside down. So I'm actually standing here upside down on the stage. In the back of your eye, my image is upside down. But your brain, literally, without you even knowing it, and you can't even prevent it from doing it, takes that upside down image and it flips it right side up. Now, for two generations or more, we have excluded any evidence that says the box has a box maker from our college campuses and our educational system. Anything that even casts doubt upon the idea that the box made itself is not even allowed to be shown. Uh, Georgia, about a decade ago, passed a law where they had to put a sticker on their biology books that said, evolution is, is a theory, not a fact. That's all that sticker said. The Supreme Court threw it out, or maybe it was the Supreme Court of Georgia, it threw it out and said, you can't put that sticker on the book. Because if, if there's only two possibilities, either the box made itself or there's a box maker, if you cast doubt on the idea the box made itself, it only leaves the other possibility. And we've allowed our legal system to, to misinterpret our Constitution such that there's this separation and you're not allowed to mention anything dealing with God. So that's the system, by law. By law, you can't cast doubt on evolution. Now, teachers do it. Praise God, we have Christian teachers, we have Christian professors. But there's a program where everything is filtered through the grid. Millions of years, billions of years, millions of years, billions of years. And literally, these students' minds and these professors' minds can't even grasp the possibility that literally some of these things in the Bible could be true. So how is that? And by the way, Christian universities economically have to look credible to the world. And Christian universities have people who have been trained in the sciences as part of their faculty, and that's their filter. Millions of years, billions of years, they can't consider anything else. They assume it's as much a fact as gravity. It's not. It's all based on assumptions. So they filter everything through that, and they don't even know they're doing it. So back to your question. How is something like this perceived? It will form a crack in some people's thinking, but with many people, it won't get through. It can't get through the filter. Their brain is so filtered to think in only a certain way. The father of modern psychology made this statement, all right? Study how people think. There is nothing so ridiculous that if not repeated often enough, people will believe it. That's how our brain works. And we can't stop it from happening. Uh, in your presentation, you had three rows. On the left was the symbols. And the, that was, I presume, in the... That was in the original document, which was lost, by the way. In the birch bark. Yes, yes. And then you had a series of, na of, uh, of words... words. Where did they come from and what did they, now, how did they relate to the where, symbol? Where they came from, and the story's all in that David McCutcheon translation. He, you know, that original uh, Dr. Konstantin Rafinsky, he would, took the, the document that had the symbols, and then he went and started working with the, the, the Native Americans, the Indians. And, and, and at times he would have to go to people who had worked with them to translate their, their pictorial language. And he learned what words were tied to those symbols. So the, the document didn't come with the words, but he kind of worked it all out and documented where they came from and, and how it all came about. Um, and, you know, he may have made mistakes, but in general, I, I have a feeling it's a pretty neat, scholarly, accurate uh, representation of what was being taught by these people. Regarding the symbols, um, <clears throat> I've, been, I've read that from the... In, in a nutshell, there are a lots and lots of similarities between the ancient Phoenician writing, some of the ancient Egyptian kind of stuff, um, and also up in Scotland there are things called um, 
they're, they're just a series of dashes and hash marks that, that formed an early language. And we find some of those from like a Norwegian, uh, Irish, um, uh, Druid type people also in the New England, North America area. Now, after the flood, people are highly inventive. They're rebuilding their cultures. Within hundreds of years, you have hundreds of thousands. Within four or five hundred years, you have millions of people in different cultures around the world. They are phenomenal sailors and shipbuilders and explorers. There, there is a map called the Reese Pyre map, all right? It was, it was, it was, made, and it's got all sorts of footnotes, in the 1500s by an Italian uh, cartographer who was an admiral in the Italian um, Navy. It shows the coast of Art Antica that is absolutely, totally accurate of where the land is in Art Antica when it's not covered with ice. All right? Now, I have, a, I have a letter that documents in 1960 this map was sent to the cartographers of the United States Air Force because they're very interested in the, in the topography of the land around the U.S. And he was a professor from university and he asked the head cartographer of the United States Air Force in 1960 to look at this map, compare it with what we know about the coast of Antarctica since we sent sonar mapping through the ice and we now know where the coastline is. And he responded back, it is absolutely totally consistent with the current coastline of Antarctica before it was covered with ice. We have no idea how this map could have come about. The map refers to previous documents that go clear back to Alexandria, the Library of Alexandria, which collect knowledge from way back in early history before the Greeks clear back into the Egyptian time, okay? During the Ice Age, the oceans was warmer, the water levels were lower, there wouldn't have been ice along the coastline of Ardanica. So 38, 3,700 years ago, people were sailing around the world looking at this new world. They really literally were explorers in the North American continent 36, 37, 38, 3,900 years ago. They've left all sorts of evidence. They've left writings. They've left monuments. The mound builders were pre they were, they were pre-people that probably weren't the Delaware Indians. Um, so, yeah, I think there's been a mixing of blood. I think there's been a mixing of, of cultures. I think there has been influence from Europeans. Now, this particular document certainly seems to follow a very a systematic trail that it came across the Bering Straits and down into North America and spread out from there. But there's all these other documents, all these other writings, all these other pyramid-type novelty things in both South and North America that predate this period. And I think that's, it fits biblically. Those were people exploring this new world during the Ice Age, while the oceans were warmer, um, in, especially in the warmer areas, um, southern United States, uh, Central America areas, during the Ice Age. So... Uh, those are observations. By the way, there's a Harvard professor that wrote an entire book on all of the mystery of all these ancient writings that have been found in these burial mounds and Indian tombs and various places all over the United States that had to have predated um, what we consider the, the Native American Indian cultures. But it fits biblically. It's just people exploring the world very shortly after the Tower of Babel. I read a book um, just recently here on Bernard Ram wrote a book on New Testament Christian evidences and it reminds me a lot of you and your ministry because um, he was saying that when you take a theme or a fact out of the Bible and in one case the resurrection he says that you pull from uh, history, prophecy, miracles and all you sorts bet. of logical evidence and he says basically as Christians we have hundreds of guns to fire and when a non-believer uh, argues with us, he has to not only um, take, silence us in each one of those guns, but he has to completely demolish it. Because if he leaves a bit of evidence there, then it points, like you said, in a dark room, it points to the thought that maybe there's truth there, and they have to struggle with that. Yep. And he says, That's great. Well put. He, and he says the point is that all of our guns are firing at once. And so they have to attack every single gun and demolish every one of them. And it seems to me like the point to me is that we just need to start firing our guns. 
And, and, and I love it. That was very, very, very well put. I, there's not a lot I can add to it. I'm going to do, give you two comments because I like to teach, and, and, and I'm going to use it as a teaching moment. I like to say it's a tool in our toolbox. It's, it's not like this is the only tool. It's not the tool some people need, but don't neglect it because it's a very, very important tool. God didn't start with creation for no reason. And furthermore, when you're trying to explain how the box made itself, we realize the story of evolution it's like an enormous puzzle. It really is. I mean, how do you explain matter and energy where it came from? How do you explain the gaps in the fossil record? There's enormous gaps between very different body types. How do you explain the information content of DNA? These are the various guns that you were talking about. They're enormous in their implication, and they're all on our side. Well, if, if trying to figure out where everything came from is like a puzzle, the box is just filled with these puzzle pieces, okay? I mean, but there's pieces over here, and there's pieces out there, and there's some pieces over there, and there's just pieces everywhere. And the evolutionists, what they've got to do is they got to, if they don't fit, they got to take a pair of scissors, and they got to kind of rework them in order to get them to fit. And eventually, people are inventive. I mean, you can line up a tricycle and a bicycle and a motorcycle and a car, and you can convince people, see, there's this sequence of things. It's the evolution of transportation. They'll do it with fossils. But it does, they all had creative, in, you know, a creator, and they were specifically designed for specific functions, and one didn't turn into another. See, what God has given us is the cover on the box of the puzzle. That's what this is. We've got to help people understand that. And then the puzzle comes together. We understand the mastodons. We understand the Ice Age. We understand why we find ancient writing in America from the Phoenicians. Because there was an Ice Age. Because of the flood, there was an Ice Age. Because of the development of humanity, they could have traveled. They could have seen the coast of Ardenica when it was uncovered by ice. Enormous mystery to the rest of the world. And that's the kind of, that's the gun I'm working on next. That next book that talks about this writing in America, that talks about the coast of Arnett and uncovered. It talks about they had batteries in Babylon 2,600 years ago. They found clay jars with an anode and a cathode filled with acid. I mean, it was dried up, but it was a literal operating battery. That newsletter that I passed around, and there's free copies over here, just came out a month ago. We were doing typesetting 3,200 years ago. Gutenberg is called the most important man that lived in the last 1,000 years that totally changed all of Western history because he developed a system where you could take movable type and reproduce copies of writing on a mass basis. And it totally changed the world we live in. That changed everything. And that happened in about 600 years ago. He didn't invent it. In Ancient Greece, about 3,200 years ago, they found a clay disc made from movable type where they had type. They would move around and make clay impressions on a clay disc, and then they could make another copy and make another copy. Exactly the same concept. Um, the, the, the technology just got lost because mankind's always wiping each other out, and that culture disappeared, and, and the knowledge went with it. Uh, and we went back to hand copying a copy at a time on papyrus. So... But the point is, there's all this evidence, there's all those guns, I love it, that we, we can just open up those cracks in people's minds to help them realize. And once again, back to the beginning, it's about the attack on the trustworthiness of God's own statements to us, His Word, His literal Word. And if you can destroy people's trust in God's trustworthiness, then everything else is going to fall like a row of dominoes. Satan is brilliant in his strategy, and he's been very effective, but God's also given us the solution. Teach the next generation the great acts of God.